ho, ho, Merry Christmas! Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of You Gotta Act, a podcast about actors and acting. Today we have a special Christmas episode and to be festive in these times of need, we've decided to do a reunion show, bringing together two friends and two friends of the podcast, Denis Minochet and Jordan Beswick. Hey. Hello. Hey guys. Hey. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for ah, joining us. Pleasure. So, so great. I've missed you. Think about yeah. you all the time. Me and Alessandro are always talking about your episodes and you as people. It's like, honestly, highlight. Highlight wow. of this podcast so far, honestly. Thank you. It's a highlight for me. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. And obviously, you know, we've been thinking about you, you know, in the context of COVID and how, you know, working is difficult. Denis, I know you, you've been like waiting to work and uh, Jordan, you've been doing your classes through Zoom, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so well done to you both for continuing to do stuff as much as you can. Like it's generally motivating as we do this podcast in our house, you know, we have to keep going. So let's do it together. <laughs> All right. Sounds great to me. Yeah. All right. So since this is a Christmas episode, I've asked you both to um, choose some Christmas movies. And we were a bit unsure, you know, obviously we thought about Die Hard, but uh, <laughs> we went more yeah. Christmassy than that. And, um, and the reason why I asked you both to come together is because obviously, like I said, you're friends and you work together regularly. So I hope we can talk about how you work together, even as we talk about these Christmas films. So, yeah. Um, don't need to introduce you. I mean, if people want to know more about you, they can watch your, your episodes, which are episode one and three. And uh, yeah, but before we start, can you tell us uh, how you met, perhaps, to start? Oh. When was it, John? When, uh, I, I remember how, but what date? Gosh darn. It, it, was, it was the early 2000s. Yeah, you know? like three or four. Yes. Yeah. Jo Jordan was, had a workshop in, uh, in Odeon, Odeon in Paris. And uh, I, I heard through word of mouth because I, I was always keen to go tr train in English because I always mm. loved it. And I was taught by a British woman, Leslie. And then I went for a weekend to work with Jordan. I had a blast. It was amazing the way he, he brings you slowly to answer his questions as the character blew my mind. And I could not let him go away and I had to stay and I kept on coming back <laughs> yeah cool yes yeah. my old haunt my old haunt at studio veo vf which was which was lovely I mean I, I ended up doing workshops there for 13 years until they closed their doors and mm. and then moved to where I am presently but uh yeah so we had a lot of great great uh experiences and and great work there so yeah. amazing it was cool. insane I mean, can I have a, a little anecdote that to say how insane that was? Absolutely. I mean, it's, you always have like scenes to, to, to work on. You never really know who you're going to work with, but you always like every day you give it new scenes to, from famous or not movies or plays. And uh, through like there's a, a workshop that lasts a month. Mm -hmm. So for a month, you're just learning scenes and you don't really know what you're going to do. You're always on, you know, keep, he keeps you on your toes. And um, one workshop, I really was working every night, learning my lines and trying to get, get into zone because uh, I thought I knew how acting felt and I didn't really because Jordan always make the, the, the reality of the scene and the moment completely. He brought it to the surface in a way that is just incredible because you feel differently and you feel like you're never going to achieve that again mm -hmm. at the same time. And so I worked hard, hard, hard. And then at the end of the workshop, after four weeks, I will never forget that. He put me on a chair in the middle and he made me close my eyes and I could hear people moving around and other people I've worked with, because it's only most of the time two actor scenes, mm -hmm. with my eyes closed and, it, and I could hear that pieces of dialogues from scenes that I've worked on, but I've worked on so many scenes. And the thing is, Jordan will always teach you to place yourself on action at the moment where your character is alive and feeling where he came from emotionally and what he wants and what is happening. And I could feel myself shifting and, you know, because I could hear a piece of dialogue and 
it will bring it all back. I would get back into the zone of that scene in character. And then another dialogue from another scene. And, whoosh, and, it, and that was an amazing one. Thank you, wow. Jordan. I love you. <laughs> yeah, you're very welcome. I love that exercise. <laughs> <laughs> that feels, yes. that seems transcendent, yeah. Well, it's really cool because it forces people to just be where they're meant to be as as a, a specific character, but they don't know, they, they, they don't anticipate anything. They can anticipate nothing. The only thing that they've got going on for themselves is everything that they have in fact created, everything that they have in fact prepared. And then all they do is, is literally hear the dialogue, they hear the person talking to them and they just respond in character. They're immediately placed as their character. Mm. And it's a beautiful thing because it really also goes to, um, it really says to the actor, you worked hard and you've created all of these things and now you can trust it, do you know? Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. This, um, the idea of trusting your work that you've done is the most important, I think, when, when you're in a class contest or con context or preparing something. Like when I did my acting class and finally we were approaching the date of, the actual show like we had a few days doing it and it was so strange because at the same time I was completely not scared which was surprising for me I wasn't scared but um but then obviously I was <laughs> at the same time and once I was on stage it was always different but I always kind of trusted the moment and fell back on what was, what was happening in that moment and the lines brought me always where I had to be. And I think that's interesting because like when we talk about actors, we talk often about, it seems to me like people talk about the actor, you know, separated from the text or the lines when actually the text is your lifeboat and it's where you get everything from. Even in a context, like you were saying, like you're, you're just hearing something that you worked on. It's, it really resonates with you. And I, I guess that's when we know that, you know, a text is powerful because it can do that to you and you've really worked on it. And um, yeah, working on Uncle Vanya, like that was crazy because his lines, Chekhov's lines are always so rich. That you could tell them in so many ways. They can mean so many things that you're, you just trust that and you trust your own, pra your own work. It makes for beautiful moments. I would love to do that exercise. <laughs> you should, you know, do children's workshop. I mean, every actor should do children's workshop, to be honest. It is really amazing. Yeah, yeah, I would love yeah. to do it. Next time you come to Europe, if it's possible, we'll, we'll do it. Hopefully, hopefully. My next one is uh, scheduled to start March 1st. And uh, so fingers crossed that I can actually get there in person mm. for it. But again, I'm the luckiest person because, oh my gosh, the internet exists and and they're proving to be wildly successful online as well. So, So it's and that's at the end of the day, the important thing is that the work's getting done and the work, the work that they're doing is really extraordinary. And, and so we, we just choose to be grateful, 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 grateful. Yeah, I agree. There's so, a piece of it missing. I've been doing read throughs and rehearsals on, on, the, on Zoom for the film that we have to start over again. It's been 10 months since we stopped it, which is insane as well. But uh, there's a, uh, I feel, there's just something missing about human beings being in front of you. Uh, and how do how do you feel that there's there's a there's something else that just listening mm. and looking at someone. It's just there's a feeling that you don't have with the internet. I'm I'm craving for that again, really, mm. really. It's <laughs> always nicer. It's always nicer to have the actual person standing in front of you. I mean, uh, uh, to have that physical contact is so 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 much mm. nicer. But at the same time, you know, like each and every one of us right now, we have we have very specific relationships. I mean, we we are who we are. We are who we are to each other, and so we 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 relate. We 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 deal with each other. We are affected by each other, even though it's via technology. And and so that for me is the challenge for the actor on technology is to create themselves and their relationships to that extent, so that they are in fact just relating with each other, dealing with each other, being affected by each other, just mm. with technology, mm. you know? Yeah, I mean, it's mm. kind of similar to, you know, when I watch a film, I feel things, even though these people are not in the room. True. So I guess if we, if that's true, then why wouldn't it be true for Zoom, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shall we get into the Christmassy vibes? 
Yeah. Let's do it. So this is jingle. <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah we we should have like i wanted to buy a christmas hat and all that but anyway we are christmassy in our spirit so yes. um i asked you to pick some films and one film that i expected to be there but that we chose um was meet me in st louis mm -hmm. st louis that's how you pronounce it yes um starring judy garland uh jordan you actually chose that one but um, I'm sure we all agree that it's a very Christmassy film. Um, yeah. I had never seen it before, but I knew that it had a reputation for being Christmassy. And it's interesting because the Christmas scene doesn't come until the end, essentially. Um, but um, I really like the family uh, aspect of it and um, the joy in everyday life that you find in it. And I really like Judy Garland's performance as well, which is fascinating because... She was only 21 years old and she clearly is young, but she's got such a maturity and yeah. it's, it's striking. Like she feels like a talented child. Well, given that she'd been working since she was five, do you know, it, it's, it's, it's very, it, it's, you know, and it's interesting because there was this one, she, she did this one um, uh, event where they were honoring, I think it was, um, um, they were honoring like Dean Martin uh -huh. and she, she came out to do a number. She came out to sing a song. And before she came out to sing her song, the person who was the MC <clears throat> said that he had remembered when she was nine years old and he had lifted her up on the piano for the first time <clears throat> and that she sang at nine, like a woman and a woman who had been hurt. Do you know? Wow. And it was just a remarkable thing to say. Do you know? Mm. And <clears throat> and she and she did. She always had this this maturity about her. Um, and it is interesting because she, as we were talking about, she um, she didn't want to do the, the 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 role. She didn't want to do the movie because she felt like she didn't want to do another teenager. Do you know? She was twenty one at the time, and the character is seventeen. <clears throat> which was interesting to me because she was 17 when she did Wizard of Oz. So when she did Wizard of Oz, she was at the absolute perfect age for Meet Me in St. St. Louis. Um, <clears throat> but again, she did the movie and it's one of the greatest movies. And everybody acknowledges that it's one of the greatest movies ever made. So, and she of course is everything in the movie. Mm. So, but I agree with you. I love, the thing that I love so much about the films that we're talking about is that the common theme for me is that at the end of the day, it's really all about family and friends. If you've got family and friends, you're rich. Mm. Do you know that that's what's ultimately the most important thing that we get so caught up in this idea of what gives us value and what makes us valuable and what is valuable in life. And at the end of the day, it's it's really about the love of our of our friends and family. So mm. I love the movie. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it is beautiful. She, it's true to think about her voice. I think, and and that's just constantly like bewildering to me that she could sing that way. I think critics at the time were saying that she, yeah, like you said, she sounded like an adult when she was young. And that's why they didn't really know what to do with her when she first arrived in Hollywood, because she was kind of in the in-between age, like too old to be a child star, but too young to be a young woman in films. And so when she started, she was in these comedies. And um, and the, the fact that throughout her career, she felt so, she had such low self-esteem and she, she was con constantly criticized by the studios is baffling. Because I didn't know anything about that when I first saw her in films. And yeah. she radiates confidence, like because she is so odd. She she is so herself. She's got such particular moves and you know eyes and voice. And yet, knowing that that was a problem at the time is ridiculous. Well, and also you know I mean she was always being she was always being tortured for being overweight. Do you know? Mm -hmm. And and so that that was problematic. Do you know? that that was an issue, if you will, like body shaming and whatnot. I know. Yeah. 
It's ridiculous. She's gorgeous. And still being tortured for being overweight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, child, I was too when I was growing up. So I, I had her hand. <laughs> yeah. In my modeling days, that was a thing as well. So, yeah, I guess nothing changes, but yeah. Nothing really. Yeah. How, it it how... says a lot about that era as well, where they, they used to fabricate movie stars. And some people would just, you know, you're not allowed to talk about yourself. You just have to, to move towards this image that is fake. And uh, it made a lot of people miserable. Mm. Hence the drugs and the overweight. Yeah. So, definitely yeah, yeah it's tragic yeah. but yeah but that's not very christmasy what we're saying now yeah that's um, not very christmasy <laughs> but friends well, and family well, are, are, are the most important thing <laughs> during yes, covid i know it I know. Thank you. <laughs> you know thankfully on that film you know like margaret o'brien who played tootie she um she talked about after the fact far you know much 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 after the fact um because she was seven at the time when she did the film. And um, she talked about how wonderful Judy Garling was, how, how she was just so much fun and that she loved kids and that it was she was constantly playing mm. with her and the kids and whatnot. And she created this unbelievably fun, happy, joyous set. And um, that because it was so fun, um, that she found it difficult at times to, when she was called upon to get really emotional, when she was, she was called upon to cry, because she was known as one of the best criers in the business when she was five and six and seven years old. Right. And, um, and you know, there have been stories about how she, they would get her to cry. And, and she said, the stories about being told that my dog died and all this kind of stuff are wrong. That's not what happened. She said that what happened was, is that the, 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 the two actresses who were known to cry the best on the MGM lot were her and June Allison. And, and that um, her mom, before she did the, the, the one big scene where she's meant to cry so, so much, do you know, mm -hmm. um, came to her and said, you know, honey, it's cool. If you don't really cry, they'll put tears in your eyes, like a lot of actresses do the ones who aren't as good as June Allison. <laughs> she said that immediately got her <laughs> crying because she was not going to be outdone by June Allison. And the funny thing is, is that she was seven. That's insane. You know? <clears throat> That's mad. I mean, it works because it is generally upsetting to watch that scene when she's like sobbing so much. But um. Oh, yeah okay fair enough i guess i mean if, if her mom reassured her afterwards then that's fine no, nobody you know died but okay the thing was is that she didn't say anything harmful to her yeah do you know what i'm saying she said something that made her competitive she didn't she didn't say something to to damage her which you find so often mm. where people are are saying things and doing things that are conceivably damaging to the individual to get them to have the specific reaction mm. as opposed to something constructive um, and when you're dealing with a kid it's so important that you don't do anything to damage them now denny you've worked with young kids yeah in very very harrowing situations yeah and you know how important it is to create that environment of security i just tell them that santa claus doesn't exist and it does the <laughs> oh, trick. Oh, oh, oh. You're evil. <laughs> and What's every time? <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine <laughs> you tell them you tell them i played santa claus once so that tells you he's not real <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but yeah, and also another thing I read about the film is that um, we were talking about her Judy Garland's body image issues. And actually, she said that it's on that film that she started feeling really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And she's gorgeous, obviously. She's so beautiful in a very mature way again. And um, apparently that's partly why she eventually married uh, Vincente Minelli, because he made her beautiful in the film. And um, made her feel beautiful. And yeah. yes, they fell in love on that set, do you mm. know? I guess it's fair enough, you know? <laughs> it meant a yeah. lot to her. <laughs> but yeah. And you know, people people like to, people people seem to want to um, suggest that, that musical stars, that they were lesser actors. 
And so oftentimes, I'm sorry, but these musical stars were exceptional actors. Not They weren't just great performers. I mean, they were unbelievable actors because everything totally. that they were doing was in character. Mm. Do you know? Everything. Yeah, it's, she it's was striking. Bad. Yeah. And when, anytime I watch those 40s musicals, that's the thing that strikes me is that you, do, you would expect them to be tacky and fake, but they are so real. They are more real than some film noirs you watch at the time because they have this... I think that's what music does. It's an easier path to certain emotions. And when it's a complex emotion, that's an amazing tool to use. And if, yeah. if your character sings a song about the situation and then has to you know, stop singing and still be in that situation, it makes the experience so much richer and the emotion so much more present, especially if you sing like Judy Garland, obviously. Yes, and I tell you, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because so oftentimes, uh, you know, when I work with, with singer actors, they have to be reminded that you're not just supposed to sing a song well, you're supposed to be communicating with that song. Mm -hmm. You know, you are somebody communicating very specific things. You, you know, you're expressing something very, very real to the character. So you can't just think in terms of singing well. Mm -hmm. And that's what you always got with these people is they knew who they were and they knew what they were singing about. They knew what they were expressing in those songs, what they were communicating um uh with those songs and and she was so so great and but i love so much too that they're such a family mm. they're such a family that that those actors are such a family and their timing is impeccable yeah in scenes yeah with know? the the catch up at the beginning it's it's really on point yeah <laughs> It's beautiful. And to think that this was adapted from a series of short stories in the New Yorker and then a, a book, I think. I don't mm -hmm. think they turned it, I don't, I don't remember if they turned it into a play as well, but they really make these characters oh, jump out of the page, you know? Yes, they did. Um, but I didn't, I tell you, I'm glad though that I didn't live in the days when Halloween was so dark. <laughs> I know. Jiminy it's Cricket. Insane. Do you know that their Halloween where was the candy? You know, <laughs> no, it's just blood and guts and oh, throwing stuff at people. people. <laughs> <laughs> it's insane. Yeah, that that scene felt very extreme. Um, I think they wanted to cut it off at some point, but I'm glad they didn't because that's why I like in these old films is that they actually go to extremes, you know. Mm. Um, and this act can actually take us to the follow-up film, following film, which is um, "It's a Wonderful Life," mm. where similarly there are some moments that are unbearable in their suffering it is such a brutal film it and it's is, interesting because yes. every time i think about it's a wonderful life i think you know the title is it's a wonderful life you don't think about the negative stuff but it's it's just relentless torture for like an hour 15 minutes of the film and then it gets better very like with a lot of difficulty but it does it's such a beautiful film but yeah. interesting that such a christmas classic is actually so such <laughs> like a torture to watch on some level it's dark do you really think it's that dark i mean it's it's it is but then i mean it's 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 capra it is yeah. it is a you you're watching art and movement and actors in, in the storyline and all those things is amazing yeah and, uh, yeah maybe I'm, I'm a different kind of uh i'm not like yeah i love to watch the work and i think it's insane what they did all of all those different actors and and the rhythm of it is fascinating to me, mm -hmm. fascinating. And to think that it was all shot on a massive set. Mm -hmm. They created Bedford Falls, like the whole thing, all the buildings, the offices, the post office, whatever, that's all fake. Well, and in the old days, snow. it was all sound stages. Everything yeah. was built on sound stages. And I mean, it really even required that you use your imagination even that much more. Do you know what I mean? Everything True. was, if you will, artificial, mm. do you know? But boy, those art directors, good grief. Amazing. Yeah. I wonder what they did with the set work, after. Yeah, to just walk, just now, just have a walk over there. To see yeah. <laughs> yeah but, but you know, like with, like with Meet Me in St. Louis, um, uh, It's a Wonderful Life, they don't shy away from, from the darkness of life, do you know? I mean, they don't shy away from the, the problems and the issues and things that, that affect people in those, those, those ways. 
and and it really is ultimately though about the triumph of the human spirit and and you know because it's a choice as to how we see this life either we see it as a wonderful life or we see it as a nightmare do mm -hmm. you know and and i love the fact that that he comes to see just what a wonderful life he has and has had do you know yeah it's interesting because um in a way you could see the message of the film as a bit you know uh conservative if you want it's like oh have a family and be happy but in in reality it's not even that because the message is more you know take what happens to you and be you know be glad that you get to experience some things and to think on your feet and do something about it and then eventually you will get rewarded for it in some way you know just by the way people remember you simple as that even if even if there wasn't a scene at the end where everybody brings money to Jimmy Stewart, I think he would still be thankful that oh, yeah. he got to make these choices, you know? He wasn't anticipating that ending. No, exactly. He wasn't anticipating all of those people coming in and 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 giving him all that money. Yeah. Do you know? But once again, it 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 it's all about what we focus on. Do we focus on what we have or what we don't? Mm. And no? it's it's interesting to see that in Jimmy Stewart's performance, actually, because mm -hmm. There's a few moments in the film, every time he has a disappointment, you see him be surprised and disappointed, but then eventually he will put on a brave face and carry on. Mm -hmm. And I love the way Capra f like focuses on these moments. There's the moment when uh, his brother returns from college mm -hmm. and they're at the train station and he finds out right there that his brother is getting married to a woman because not because, but like partly because um, this woman's father has often offered him her job, which means that the brother will not be coming back to Bedford Falls to take over the um, uh, building and loan uh, mm -hmm. company. So that that means Jimmy Stewart will again stay stuck in Bedford Falls. And there's this amazing shot on him. It's like a tracking shot on his face that shows his realization of this this moment. But then as he rejoins the people, there's a kind of, he just kind of, you know, he, he takes it and he lets it go. And eventually he's angry again, but there's always this, it's as if he like, he couldn't stay mad because somewhere he knows, or he doesn't know, but somewhere he does like the way he lives. He does enjoy that. And I think someone like Jimmy Stewart, who's so expressive and delicate, even as he's very loud and you talk like this all the time, he can be <laughs> so subtle. And you needed, like you were saying, because it was a set, you needed a lot of imagination and energy to make this convincing. And I think he's got that 100%. Yes, and also he, I tell you that character, he's like just so many people in mm -hmm. life. And one of the things that he's not necessarily taking into consideration throughout the majority of the time is that because he continues to believe himself to be without a choice, do you know? But what he comes to realize is, is that he's had the choice all along. He's just yeah. been making the choice that he's been making. And he's been making it because I'm sorry, he's, I hate to tell him, but he's a really good person. He's like his father. And he isn't as selfish as he would like to believe himself to be. You know, so, so oftentimes it's like, I want so badly to be selfish. I want so badly to be selfish. I don't want to, I, please let me stop caring for other people <laughs> so I can do things for myself for a change and, and, and go to Europe and, and just do what I need to do for me. But something in you keeps, keeps you making choices that are very, you make sacrifices because God, you, you really actually care about people. And, mm. and, and, and without knowing it, you are nourishing yourself, you are feeding yourself. But if you keep believing that you're doing it because you don't have the choice, you, you resent the people that you're helping. Yeah. So he was always caught between that thing. You know, he was happy to help everybody. You know, in fact, it, it was imperative that he help everybody because he knew that if he didn't help anybody, where were they going to get the help? Do yeah. you know? And so he did it mm. and he was very happy doing it, but he would get resentful. Do you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, it, it's funny because like not to like blow my own horn but this podcast is called you gotta act and i think what the jimmy stewart character does a lot is he acts he doesn't you know he acts on when a situation come arises he acts he thinks you know and it i think jimmy stewart is again great casting because 
like you were saying, his tone, but at the same time, eventually he just does the thing that he has to do and he doesn't think twice. And in a way, it's a film that's really much about, very much about, you know, yeah, you have a choice. You have the choice to act and you can do something and he does. And eventually maybe, yeah, you will resent it, but see it as a choice because you you could have, when he, when he steps over the the counter of his uh, build of his uh, business mm -hmm. when everybody's there about to run away to Potter to get their shares for half the price. That's a crazy thing to do. I mean, most people would just be like, oh no, don't run away off. Oh, okay. But he jumps over and he tells them, no, 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 you have to understand. Like you made a promise, like stay there. This is amazing acting in the, all the senses of the word. And remember in the taxi cab, because they were on their way to go to their honeymoon, mm. you know, with all that money that they were going to spend just on themselves and, and, and give themselves the luxury of this wonderful gift of, of, of a honeymoon together. And he sees the run on the bank. And so he gets out and she goes, no, 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 stay in the cab, please stay in the cab. <laughs> Let's just yeah. go. Let's just go. And he can't do it. He can't do it but mm. then she joins them and she says look we've got the money and and i tell you it's just but again at that point when by accident the money isn't stolen the money is accidentally finds its way into potter's hands and of course he's going to take gross advantage of it because he's an evil mother and 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 uh and it, it sends jimmy stewart into that spiral that downward spiral, mm. you know, what is my life been worth? And am I in fact worth more dead than I am alive? And, and should I have ever been born? And I, I just think the movie is just so extraordinary in terms of dealing with the human condition. And, yeah. and even the best people, even the best people, do you know, question and doubt, do you know? Mm. Yeah, that's, that's one reason why the film, I think, resonates with so many people is because whether you consider yourself a good person like that or whether you admire him because you are actually, you think you're selfish or whatever, you have those doubts and everybody has them, you know, we all, because we all have those choices to make and to see a character make them and then regret and then struggle. It's so much better than, you know, seeing a film where you see a perfect guy doing everything right. Like that would be boring. You know, if he's if from the beginning, it's like, Oh yeah, my life is great. I'm, I'm fine. You know, it wouldn't, that wouldn't be real. That would be really realistic. I think. Well, even Christ questioned, do you know what I'm saying? I mean, mm. before he carried on with his mission, do you know, he had to question, yeah. do you know, and he did, and he made his choice. And, and it's the same thing with old George. He, he, he does, he questions. And you see him in that moment too, when Potter is offering him the job, but he then realizes what that actually means. And even though he would love more than anything else in the world to accept this, this, opportunity he says no i no i i can't i can't do it because then this thing that needs to exist won't exist anymore do you know yeah. and i'm the only thing standing between its existence and it's it's you know ceasing to exist yeah that's 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 a huge responsibility mm, yeah it's like you were saying denise the construction of the film as well that's brilliant and that seeing mm -hmm. jimmy stewart going through all these stages Perfectly. Yeah. I mean, like he's he's so torn in so many moments. I love this actor. I, I he one of my favorite films is uh, Rear Window, and mm. I, I think he's, uh, that one and Vertigo. I love them. No, and, and I love the, the the spirit of the film as well. You know, when it begins with the the stars talking to each other about this guy, and I think that's very Christmassy for me. That. You can always relate on some something else to protect you and to just uh, look after you because you're a good person. And I think uh, it's all about if you've been a good boy, you're gonna get toys. It's kind of the same sort of thing, but it is the, it is a good vibe because if you have that, then you try to do good around you, which is which is always nice. Yeah, you know? totally. Yeah, it is more. It is about more than toys. That's for sure. Like yeah. again, like before we continue, one thing in the film is clearly it's about you know, the contrast between people and money, you know, wanting money, wanting things, wanting luxury. And, you know, it's super interesting that George Bailey works uh, to give people housing because mm -hmm. that is a material thing, but that's also housing. That's where you put your family. That's where you put your people and your friends. 
and he allows everyone to have that. Mm -hmm. It's it's a very interesting. Like it could be such a. I think the fact that that's his job makes it so much more ambiguous because he needs people to give him their money, but he also does, does that for them. And there you have the torn idea as well of you know profit and you know spiritual profits if you want. <laughs> that's yeah. but that's so what's so interesting about that business and why the Lionel Barrymore character Potter is constantly talking about how um, <clears throat> like his father and he himself are suckers because the reality is, <clears throat> is they don't profit. They don't profit from this. They're really doing everything that they're doing to help people who would otherwise not be able to get any assistance, yeah. you know? And and yeah, it, it affords them a, a livelihood, but they don't, they don't really profit the way that so oftentimes um, banks are created to give loans, but child, they profit <laughs> from it, you know? For sure. and, and and their their building and loans situation was really about the people and helping people, mm. you know, to better their circumstances. And and it can be you know, a situation where you, you, you sacrifice so many things for the sake of others. Um, and sometimes you don't feel maybe sufficiently appreciated for what it is that you're, you're sacrificing. And, and, uh, you know, and, and there was the question when the money was found its way into the wrong hands. And he was looking at the very real possibility of a scandal and going to jail. And, wondering what did he do it all for do you know and mm -hmm. and that it was going to be a disaster and when potter's saying well just go to all these people that you've helped see let them give you money and he's like well they're not in the position and mm -hmm. and he might have even questioned whether they would you know yeah. but boy did he find out how loved he was yeah you no know? that whole sequence at the end when uh, jimmy stewart is running across bedford falls and just saying merry christmas to all the buildings <laughs> That's like the most joyous scene in any film I've ever seen. And it's it's this kind of, I mean, just like he himself, he's, he's so joyful, but he's kind of crying and just so mm. overwhelmed. And it's it's so overpowering, like that moment, you just really feel like you would, you've in that moment, I always feel so thankful for that film and for everything else. You know, I'm just like, oh my God, I have a computer. You know, I don't want to watch films on my computer, but I have a computer. It's amazing. You know, like it makes you grateful for the serious things. That's this, why this film will never get old, I think. And it's all this acting thing again, you know, it, James Stewart, I heard that you had to go get him. He was always fishing somewhere in the countryside. <laughs> he was not an actor in the, in the, the spoiled sense of it. He was just a genuine person, a family man and loving life. But then when he acts, the rhythm that he brings, like almost like a dancer, and you can so, tell that he is uh, loving, just uh, Jordan taught me that as well. So don't think, just do it. At some point, you have to go and just do it. Otherwise, you overthink it and you don't have fun. And mm. James Stewart, and that's the perfect example, that scene when it screams Merry Christmas to everyone, it, emotional. It, he's having fun. Yeah. And uh, yeah, God, I wish I, I could do that now. <laughs> uh, I have no neighbors, so I would look stupid. <laughs> no, and I agree with you. He was, I, I tell you, he was always so present. I mean, he was such a present actor, 100%. you know. Um, and, you know, it was interesting. Just recently, I watched an old roast, and they were roasting Jimmy Stewart. Uh -huh. And uh, Orson Welles was up there. Orson Welles was up there roasting him. And he told some jokes, but but it it wasn't it was more or less directed at other people on the podium, not so much Jimmy Stewart. And at the end, he said, "You know, I'm not going to I'm not going to do an imitation, you know, of you like a lot of other people have done." He goes because that's all we can do mm. is an imitation of you. Do you know what I'm saying? And it's like, oh, he paid him the greatest compliment. That's you so know? nice. It's, and just talking about what just how, what he brought to film, what he brought to acting, because he was, you, you couldn't find a more um, reliable actor as well. I mean, G-Mini Cricket. Yeah. Do it. It's Jimmy just do it. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Evil. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Um, all right. And it's funny because like rewatching It's a Wonderful Life, I realized how Jimmy Stewart indeed is very present, but he's kind of shouting the whole time. Like he's got so much energy. And this is my way of linking to the third film we're talking about, which is <laughs> Elf. Elf. <laughs> One of my I favorite. Think... Every year I watch Elf. Yeah. because it's amazing will ferrell is the best he's got a similar quality to jimmy stewart in his commitment like he's so it again he's just doing it he doesn't think much obviously there's a lot of thinking going on behind but he's such an active performer and he shouts as well i think he's so loud but it's he's brilliant i've never seen elf before i'm so glad you recommended it for this i never seen it. i think i was always a bit put off by his uh, orange tights <laughs> Oh. <laughs> that was disturbing to me. I was like, what is this film? <laughs> but because it's beautiful. Of orange tights. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was like, is it some kind of creepy situation or is he literally an elf? And he is literally a guy who thinks he's an elf, so it's fine. It's it's a fairly safe film in that sense. Oh, but yeah. And it's it's once again, it's just this beautiful story, you know, about uh, the actual value of things. And exactly. and and I, for me, it's just genius that they chose New York City for him to go to because there's not a more cynical city on the map. And it's all about people who have lost faith, you know, mm -hmm. people who don't believe anymore. And, and he, he gets them believing again. And if you can get people believing in New York City, child, you got, you got something <laughs> going on, you know. Totally, yeah. Um, I like how that idea of... Um, making people believe and people having a lost faith is present from the very beginning of how the character of Elf was born. It's called Buddy, right? Buddy? Because but, just yes. Buddy. <laughs> he, um, his father was, uh, is James Caan. Mm -hmm. And the story uh, like that's suggested through what we see, the, some pictures, some old pictures of James Caan with a girl who was uh, Buddy's mom, is that they probably met... Uh, during some protest in the 70s and now we see James Gunn now and he's you know just a businessman in New York City writing children's book and you know deleting pages because it doesn't matter it's a children's book and obviously the, the story in the, in the book doesn't make sense anymore but he doesn't care because he's saving on pages or whatever and um, yeah the, the idea that he lost his faith years and years and years ago like 30 years ago because they say that but he's 30 which i think maybe is a bit more than that but anyway <laughs> and yeah it's it's really present throughout it's a very interesting like um way to update the it's a wonderful life idea and you know of, of faith believing in something <laughs> sorry i'm thinking about will ferrell i just laughed <laughs> did you know that uh on snl he was wearing this uh weird costume i don't really i cannot really tell what it was but uh uh, some of the writers told him like you should wear it all week okay and, and he pushed the joke and he wore it until it was like in the fall he wore, he wore it all, all season long to save clothes <laughs> i mean yes that's commitment yeah. <laughs> just for a joke yeah. i love and, that <laughs> and um, i saw that the um, the scenes in new york when he's just you know walking in new york and being confused by the situation they've shot that literally just out in the wild without any, you know, without blocking streets, without ever, like warning people. And obviously only Will Ferrell could be able to do that and, you know, stay in character and never break away and never, you know, laugh himself. I mean, I'm sure he had some laughter, but he's so committed. And the fact that nobody is like, what's going on there is amazing. So that's, that's proof that how, of how cynical New York is because they see some guy in an elf suit, like almost getting run over 15 times and they don't say anything. <laughs> it's just tragic, but it serves the film really well. <laughs> yes, and old Buddy, you, you, you just have to fall in love with Buddy. And, <clears throat> and again, what's so beautiful is the fact that he has 100% belief in who he is. You know, absolute 100% belief. And, and it is challenging when you find yourself with this belief of who you are and where you come from and and you know the reality but nobody else believes it i mean everybody else is just thinks you're crazy i mean everyone else thinks you are literally insane for for believing something um and uh i don't know and yeah. and that's what you see 
you never see anything other than total belief in his eyes. Total. Yeah. When he's eating the spaghetti with, <laughs> with maple syrup or something, <laughs> he's doing it. He doesn't care. He's and yeah, I like that Will Ferrell is funny without pushing it too much. He knows that just by doing crazy stuff and looking like you be, you, you mean it, it's that's all you need. Like when he's running in the <laughs> turn turnstile door or whatever you call it. I mean, just genius, he's you know. But he's like a child. Yeah. He's like a child. And I have to be honest, that that's one of the reasons why I, I, I've had problems with productions of the musical version of it um <clears throat> on stage is because the actors playing Buddy, they 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 were doing it like they 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 knew. Oh, you, you know mean what like I'm in an ironic yeah. way. Yeah, it's like they they were playing the 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 fact that he's he's a bit, you know, kooky and nutty and all of this. And and what's lost is that innocence, mm. that child, do you know, because he is a child. I mean, the one thing and this is another reason why New York is perfect as a setting is because, you know, he has even at 30 he's retained his innocence mm. he, he's even retained his innocence in a place like the north pole where it's easier to retain your innocence but he's the most innocent person in the north pole you know? <laughs> totally yeah yeah and I, I like the the way this contrasts with james Caan, obviously who's a very you know hard-boiled kind of guy and their scenes together are, are brilliant like it's just the contrast feels so real and having having Will Ferrell in that context with someone like that, like that just brings out how innocent and lovely he is. I think it's brilliant casting. Yes. He's just, he, that character is just, yeah. he's just such a delight. I mean, he's so, so delightful. Mm. Mm. It's kind of an, like, it's kind of a Christmas version of his character in Step Brothers, I would say. And like a more PC version as well, where he's not, you know, saying gross stuff, but he's, he's just like a child again. Like he's, you know, as if he was still living with his parents kind of thing. It's the same, same situation. Um, I love the bit in the beginning when <laughs> the, his adoptive dad explains that uh, they gave him jobs that he could do. So he tests the Jack in the box. Yeah. And there's this, is, there's the massive suspense of testing each Jack in the box and knowing when the thing will come out and, he plays that so perfectly. I mean, he's genuinely terrified <laughs> of, of each box. And that, again, hilarious. like, that's just, I think there's such a commitment to, so to any kind of the humor in every situation <laughs> that you can find with him. Commitment to fell. That's for sure. Yeah. What are you guys' uh, Christmas movie lists? I, want, I wonder, you know? Do you, you mean, what sort of movies do you watch over the holidays? I mean, for me, it depends. I like to take the time off the holidays to catch up or like to watch things I've never seen before. Um, but films I like that are very Christmassy. Um, there's um, A Christmas Tale by uh, Arnaud Desplechin, which yeah. isn't like the most fun, but it's so beautiful. And yeah. it's, such, I mean, all these films I find completely fascinating and the performances are amazing. I mean, Mathieu Amalric, I could watch him in anything. Um, yeah, I really like that one. Um, and then, you know, all the French comedies of like the 80s, 70s that are always on TV. <laughs> you know, like um, uh, Le Père Noël est une ordure kind of thing. That's always there. So I've, that's how, that's why I grew up watching. That's why I never saw It's a Wonderful Life when I was a kid because it wasn't a thing in my, in my family. It wasn't like a Christmas film. I don't think my parents had never seen it. So. It was great to discover it. And then I found a DVD with French subtitles for them. So they got to experience it as well. They really liked it. But yeah, what about you? Um, I'm a classic. Uh, um, I love Scrooge with, uh, with Bill Murray. Uh, I love Gremlins. I love Die Hard. I know it's people don't think it's a Christmas movie, <laughs> but it is to me. Uh, I love uh, The Muppet uh, Christmas Carol. Uh, I just love that film. Uh, I love the Polo Express, although I don't really believe in the in the in the, the, the animation. It's mm. just the, the whole vibe and the the, the the spirit as well, and the song. I love it. It's very haunting. Yeah, <laughs> I just love Christmas movies. It puts you in such a good mood. Yeah, same. What about you, Jordan? 
Oh, good grief. I love, I love at times watching old Shirley Temple movies and, and uh, you know, see, when I was a kid growing up, I, we, that was my source of escape. I mean, I just escaped into the old movies. That's, that was just everything in the world to me. So I just watched old movies, old movies, old movies all the time. And um, so that, and that's also been what's helping me to an extent too, like deal with this whole shut-in situation and, and whatnot is I found myself all of a sudden um, going through um, all of the different movies that are in fact available on YouTube, you know, from the 30s and the 40s and, and 50s and whatnot, and just watching not just a lot of old movies that I was already, you know, in love with, but discovering a lot of other old movies that I had never seen. And it was serving a similar purpose for me. You know, mm -hmm. I was, I was just, it was really helping me to deal with everything that was going on in the world. You know, I was just allowing myself to get lost in these old movies and just enjoy, you know, all yeah. of it. So I'm, I'm just one of those types of people. And I love the old musicals. I'm just yeah. crazy for the old musicals. And MGM for me was the studio. MGM was, was just everything. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, earlier during lockdown, I spent a couple of weeks just watching musicals and which musicals I hadn't seen. And I would love to watch them now. Now, actually, I think it's very Christmas appropriate. It's true. You really get lost in them because they have such often they have this this spirit, you know, of optimism. And I guess it's what we need now. And they have such talented performance, which is it's kind of uh, frustrating sometimes because I'm like, oh, I wish I could like do some acting now but i can't <laughs> so like i just have to watch them be amazing and meanwhile be inspired by that which is good too and those old movies i really felt like i was being transported into i really feel like i'm being transported into entirely different worlds i mean yeah i because they're they're of a time that i'm not of and so so for me it's just wonderful to imagine being you know yeah living at those times and and whatnot and and because they are and it's the historical dramas and whatnot and and yeah. uh, and i do love the fact that that there was something about those old movies that was a bit larger than life it was a bit it was a bit bigger mm -hmm. you know there was something a bit more to it than yeah. than let's just be real together do you know and and so it and, it and it was it was wonderful because you know so oftentimes they'll say you know naturalism and whatnot but you go back and you watch a lot of those old movies and you find so many actors and they were so they were so their characters i mean they were so a part of the world that they were in mm -hmm. and 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 just like we're talking about with the yeah you know jimmy stewart was was acting but he as far as he was concerned he was george bailey in bedford falls and Donna Reed was his wife and I mean and they all came from these worlds and and it was just I don't know it just I love it I just I love actors and I love acting and <laughs> and they 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 I've just been inspired from the time I watched my first movie at the age of six you know it just is it's the thing that that inspires me more than anything else in the world so mm. and I, I love them love them <laughs> <laughs> yeah well this is the opportunity for me to ask one last question about you guys so you work a lot together. I know, uh, Jordan, you help Denny when he's got a part or an audition. Can you tell me a bit more about how that works? Like, I mean, also in the context of obviously COVID, I'm guessing you do that over the phone or Zoom, but even in normal times, like what's your process if we can have a glimpse of it? Don't reveal all your trade secrets, but you know. You, sh you share from your vantage point as, as the actor. Okay, um, well, <laughs> basically there's not a project that will not run through Jordan, just to only have a discussion first, mm -hmm. perhaps if it's in French or whatever, but mo all the English speaking uh, jobs or additions, we work together. So it's, it's a, a sense of, uh, um, you know, talking about the material, talking about the, t the character. Um, it's a long discussion, but what Jordan does is, and I really don't want to blow smoke really, because it's just, it, he brings you, I don't know how he does it, but he brings you to answer as a, the character. So you 
And then it's kind of challenging because you start to think like the character would think. And it's not magic or anything, it's just it's common sense. But he has all the right like questions to bring you and how about this and can you imagine that and why would happen in this. And then you feel that it's kind of a, a little spark that is inside of you. And then usually I try to learn the lines, but not I'm trying to get rid of the music of the lines it's because English is not my first language. It is hard for me. Um, and then Jordan, I, and then we Skype if Jordan's away or I go see him. And then we work on scenes and then, yeah, it makes me and pushes me towards the truth of the material. Yeah. Right. So. <laughs> Beautiful. What would you have to say, Jordan, to that? One of the things, well, I'm, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> one of the things that he shared uh, once after uh, an important um, casting of his, that he had gotten the material and he had to, in a very, very short period of time, he had to, to prepare like four really, really meaty scenes. And so we got together over, he made me a chicken. And um, and so we, 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 we had dinner and we were talking about things, but then we got to work and we, over the, like the course of four hours, we just tore the, we tore the stuff apart and, and really worked so that he was so, so clear about absolutely everything. And, and, and the best feedback was when the casting person supposedly said to him, because he shared it with me afterwards, he said that the casting person said, you're the only person who came in here and got every single nuance in every single scene. Wow. I mean, that's all you want, isn't it? It's pretty, Beautiful. pretty darn cool, you know, yeah. because, because that's why we do it. That's why we take the time with it, mm. with the material. And we really do explore it. We really do discover mm. what's there. Uh, not just in terms of the situation and circumstances, but who the character is in relation to everything. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so you know who you are. So when you mm -hmm. show up, you know who you are, you know what you think, you know what you feel, you know what your relationships are, the whole nine yards. And it makes it so much, it never makes it easy, but it makes it easier, mm -hmm. do you know? Yeah, because the, the, the thing I learned myself, and I'm not gonna say it's surprising, but it is a little bit surprising, is that it takes so long to really understand the text or a character or lines, because even the simplest lines, there's so much in them, you know, especially if it's from a great play, but I'm guessing, yeah, if you have someone who can work at that with you and help you, because eventually, you know, if you read it enough times and practice by yourself, you might get there. But I think having someone experienced like you, Jordan, to push that and someone who knows you and knows how you work, that must be amazing and such a, yeah, because nuance is the point, you know, anybody can learn the lines and say it in roughly the right way, but the nuance is where it's at. And this yeah. is what you learn when you study po poetry, you know, and, and, and you should always treat text as poetry because therefore every word counts, you know, yeah. and uh, every comma, every, uh, you know, and you should never let, let a, a stone unturned in that matter. And, uh, and then, yeah, then it's amazing to work with Jordan for that. It is. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. But you know, it's, it's what's important is also to be curious. Do you know what I mean? It's, you have to be curious and you have to be interested in, 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 in being informed and discovering what's there. And, and one of the things that I have always adored working with uh, in relation to working with Denise, is he's so curious and, and he, he, he's interested. I mean, he's, he is genuinely interested. Mm -hmm. He wants to learn. He wants to discover. He because he knows that it all it's all a benefit. Everything is a benefit. Do you know? Yeah. And then it's about putting all the pieces together, but really continuing to open himself up entirely so that everything he receives as well, uh, he allows to stimulate mm -hmm. every thing you know and then from that is born these people so it's just it's it i love working with them so mm. i guess i miss the you jordan <laughs> <laughs> no. well there, there we are reunited um, yeah <laughs> but yeah i guess that that is the the challenge like you know because i think so, so often and it's it's natural i think you know we're, as human beings we we come at things with a 
pre-existing understanding of them or preconceptions, even if we don't realize. So you will read the lines of a character and you, you think you get it. And you're like, yeah, she means this or she feels that way. But the challenge for actors is to, like you were saying, open up their minds and be open to being challenged with those ideas, which can be very stressful. I mean, I, I remember when I was studying and I enjoyed that process, but it was difficult sometimes to hear my teacher say, are you sure about this? Like, why don't you try that? And I was like, no, I've been that. I know what she's like, you know, it's fine. I've done it. But actually, like you were saying, it's so valuable because people are complex. So characters should be just as complex. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And mm-hmm. yeah, if you're curious, then you will be happy to do that process. But I'm sure I'm guessing Jordan, you adapt your, your, your practice to the people you work with and all that. But yeah, you have to, every single, every single person you work with is a different person. So, mm. so you, you, you don't, you don't deal with everybody the exact same way that that's like people who choose to believe that all actors are the same you know it's like no every single actor is a different human being so you you have to you have to work with that specific person yeah okay uh let me figure out how to end this <laughs> sorry i'm under pressure now we could sing we could sing you better song. watch out you better <laughs> <laughs> that, that could be a nice way to end <laughs> thanks Denis that will be in this is gonna end like this <laughs> <laughs> ho 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 Merry Christmas and you know we're not, we, but we just got a glimpse but we just got a glimpse of Alessandro's hair so, so maybe we should see his face <laughs> hello hey <laughs> Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Ali. Merry Christmas, you both. Thanks for listening to or watching this episode of You Gotta Act. If you wish to know in advance who our next guest will be and ask them a question, become a friend of You Gotta Act on Patreon. See you next time.